For our last discussion on intra-abdominal pressure, intra-abdominal hypertension, and abdominal compartment syndrome, we need to talk about some of the strategies and interventions that we may put in place when our patients have an elevated intra-abdominal pressure. So let's go ahead and discuss that now. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card. As well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. All right, so in this lesson, we're going to cover the management strategies for both intra-abdominal hypertension as well as abdominal compartment syndrome. Now, much of this management has actually been spelled out thanks to the work of the Abdominal Compartment Society, and I will include a link to their website in the lesson description, and they have a lot of really great information, resources, and algorithms that really can be used in the management of these patients. In order to appropriately manage these patients, it is important to quickly recognize the signs of intra-abdominal hypertension or abdominal compartment syndrome, and then to properly stage that particular patient's risk, uh, as well as recognition of any organ dysfunction. Now, while the algorithms from the Abdominal Compartment Society uh, are helpful in the treatment and management, it is important to understand not all recommendations are going to be supported with strong evidence. And making decisions solely based on the value of the intra-abdominal pressure alone can lead to under or even over treatment. There are cases where a patient may present with abdominal compartment syndrome in which conservative management may actually be warranted, and then other cases where they just have intra-abdominal hypertension, but this may require quick decision making even before reaching that 20 millimeters of pressure. Now, having experience with intra-abdominal pressure management and recognition of organ dysfunction are going to go a long way in treating these patients. Uh, if you haven't watched the lesson already, uh, I'll link to the previous lesson where I did review over the pathophysiology of elevated intra-abdominal pressure, so it's really important to know that information. All that said, our management strategy revolves primarily around four main principles. Consistently repeating serial intra-abdominal pressure measurements optimizing the systemic organ perfusion, identifying potential organ dysfunction, and targeting specific measures or procedures to control intra-abdominal pressure and minimize the potential damage to targeted organs. And then lastly, quick surgical decompression when warranted. All right, so let's start things off and talk about our management of abdominal compartment syndrome. Now for this, the primary and definitive treatment is simply a surgical decompressive open abdomen, pictured here, with a temporary closure. Ultimately, when the pressure has gotten to a point to where we are then having organ dysfunction that is resulting from this, the best way to, to deal with that and manage that is to open up that compartment with the open abdomen. Now, one patient population that we generally do quite well with to prevent ACS is in our trauma patients and of course our abdominal surgery patients. Now, given the direct issues with these areas, increased focus on intra-abdominal hypertension and ACS prevention, as well as just higher incidences of it with this patient population, um, we often will use uh, prophylactically that we'll leave someone's abdomen open after an exploratory laparotomy. Uh, and this is to allow for the expected edema and help prevent rises in intra-abdominal pressure. That said, with these open abdomens, as well as others that are done in response to abdominal compartment syndrome, uh, intra-abdominal pressure can still rise, leading to something that we call refractory ACS, and this may require a revision of that open abdomen. So once that's done, it's not necessarily a set and forget thing, we can still have problems that result. 
Remember, though, that such a surgery is not benign, and it certainly comes with its own risks and complications. Such complications include things like ventral hernia, enteric fistula, and intra-abdominal sepsis, just to name a few. It does also increase morbidity, as well as decreasing quality of life. So not anything that would be excluding us from doing this when it's warranted, but certainly a consideration instead of just jumping straight to this without necessarily meeting all the criteria. All right, so now let's talk about our actual management algorithm. So prior to reaching the point of abdominal compartment syndrome, we have many non-surgical interventions that we can put in place to try and decrease intra-abdominal pressure and try and prevent that progression from intra-abdominal hypertension to abdominal compartment syndrome. Let's start off reviewing over the overall management algorithm before we dive into some of the management strategies for elevated intra-abdominal pressure prior to reaching that point of ACS. So we begin by determining if our patient's intra-abdominal pressure is greater than 12 millimeters of mercury. If it is, we would then begin to initiate treatment modalities to reduce intra-abdominal pressure, which I will discuss further in just a few minutes here. Ultimately, our goal here is to both reduce intra-abdominal pressure as well as optimize organ perfusion. From here, we want to be checking if our patient's intra-abdominal pressure is greater than 20 with signs of new organ dysfunction. So if they don't meet both of these criteria, then at this point, we need to continue to monitor intra-abdominal pressure at least every four to six hours, if not more often. That said, there are setups such as using a three-way Foley that do allow for continuous monitoring as well, which certainly can be helpful too. If at any point intra-abdominal pressure falls below 12 and consistently stays there, then we can consider their intra-abdominal hypertension to be resolved and would discontinue our intra-abdominal pressure measurements and really just continue to monitor the patient clinically for any deterioration. If the intra-abdominal pressure is greater than 20 and new organ dysfunction is present, then this patient has abdominal compartment syndrome. At this point, we need to assess whether the patient has primary ACS, secondary ACS, or recurrent ACS. If it is primary, then the next step is the surgical decompression that I discussed earlier. So if it's secondary or recurrent ACS, then there's a chance that the organ dysfunction could already be present and not related to our current intra-abdominal pressure measurements. Therefore, we need to determine if there is new or progressive organ failure. If so, then again, surgical decompression is gonna be warranted here. In cases of recurrent abdominal compartment syndrome, if a previous decompression was performed, a revision may be necessary. Now, once either the surgical decompression is performed or if the patient has secondary recurrent ACS and there's not progressive organ failure, then we would continue our medical interventions to reduce intra-abdominal pressure. Again, I'm gonna discuss that in just a minute here, but we'll also continue to monitor serial intra-abdominal pressure measurements. And if the patient's intra-abdominal pressure is consistently below 12, then we would again consider that the intra-abdominal hypertension is resolved and then discontinue our intra-abdominal pressure measurements. If it does remain above 12, then we would continue to check if that intra-abdominal pressure rises greater than 20 and continue to monitor for any new organ dysfunction to see if that's present. If so, then we move back up the algorithm and repeat this process. And that's essentially our management algorithm, really just determining where our intra-abdominal pressure is, at what level, what our interventions are that we're gonna put in place, and then just kind of continuing to monitor either for resolution or escalation in the algorithm. So now that we've reviewed over that algorithm of the management, we need to finally talk about the medical management. Now there is an algorithm for this in which we move in a stepwise fashion from one treatment to the next if the intra-abdominal pressure is worsening or not improving. Here I'm simply going to discuss the different arms of the medical management strategies going through each item from early to later interventions. With all of these interventions though, it is important to evaluate the appropriateness of any specific intervention in the context of the patient's unique situation and cause of their intra-abdominal pressure. And there are five different components to our treatment strategy. We have evacuation of intraluminal contents. We have evacuation of intra-abdominal space occupying lesions. There's improving abdominal wall compliance, optimizing fluid balance and administration, and optimizing systemic and regional perfusion. 
So first let's talk about the evacuation of interluminal contents. So by evacuating these contents, we can reduce the volume and thus the size of the intestines. Reducing that size is gonna take up less space in the ab abdominal compartment, which is then gonna to lead to a decrease in that pressure. So first, we're actually gonna start off with simply decompression using a nasogastric tube or a rectal tube. And here, the nasogastric tube we would have set to suction. Next, we'd consider medications to try to improve either gastric or colonic mobility. So some common ones for gastric motility would be metoclopramide or reglin, domperidone or motilium, as well as the antibiotic erythromycin. There are a slew of other medications that are available for the colonic motility, but polyethylene glycol or Miralax, Senna, uh, Biscotyl or Dolcolax certainly can be used here as well and are often very effective. Now from here, we'd consider minimizing enteral nutrition as well as the uh, flushes in there as well. We'd also consider the use of enemas to further evacuate the patient. And if they're still not improving or worsening, we definitely would consider a colonoscopic decompression uh, before finally discontinuing all enteral nutrition. And then like with anything else, per the management algorithm, if things are still not improving and we've continued to progress with an intraabdominal pressure that's greater than 20 with the new organ dysfunction, then surgical decompression is going to be that next step. And that's going to be the same case for each of these arms that I'm going to talk about. All right, so next we're going to talk about the evacuation of intraabdominal space occupying lesions. So here, we need to identify and evacuate any problematic fluid collections in the abdomen. And this could also apply to tumors and hernias and, and things of that sort, but this could also be from bleeding, ascites, pancreatitis, uh, an infection and abscess, or other potential causes as well. So here, we're going to start with an abdominal ultrasound to try to identify any possible lesions. So next, we'd consider an abdominal CT scan to try and better identify any possible lesions there. Now from here, if appropriate, we would start with a percutaneous catheter drainage of a particular lesion. If that's ineffective or it's not warranted, then we'd consider surgical evacuation of that lesion. All right, so next on to improving abdominal wall compliance. And here we have a few strategies to improve the compliance, which is going to allow for better compensation of elevated intra-abdominal pressure. If you remember that abdominal wall compliance is minimized, there's no expansion of that abdominal wall cavity, and it can't compensate for those increases in pressure. So we're going to start by making sure that we have adequate sedation as well as analgesia for our patients. We also want to make sure and remove any constrictive dressings as well as address any abdominal eschars. Now, at a minimum, we want to ensure that the head of the bed is not elevated past 30 degrees, and then we may consider lying the patient flat or even possibly in Trendelenburg. And then finally, we would consider the use of paralytics to try and fully relax that abdominal wall. Now, on to optimizing our fluid balance and administration. Um, here, we need to ensure that we're avoiding excessive fluid resuscitation. And our main goal, at least initially, is to try to have these patients at a zero balance, uh, if not slightly negative fluid balance. If the patient does continue to have elevated intra-abdominal pressure and then further resuscitation is needed, uh, we do want to consider using hypertonic fluids and colloids here. And then from here, once stable, um, we do want to remove fluid through either the judicial use of diuretics, or finally, we can consider dialysis, ultrafiltration, or CRT for that fluid removal. And then the last arm is going to be optimizing the systemic and regional perfusion. And here, we need to ensure that we're delivering adequate perfusion to end organs. So this requires both oxygen content as well as the appropriate blood flow. So we want to be using goal-directed fluid resuscitation. And so we do want to evaluate fluid responsiveness in the patient with the goal of ultimately increasing their cardiac output. We also need to optimize ventilation and alveolar recruitment to ensure adequate optimization of oxygen delivery. And then finally, we need to ensure hemodynamic monitoring to guide resuscitation efforts. Ultimately, vasopressors and inotropes may be warranted to ensure that we are having adequate perfusion. And then again, just as a review, like we discussed in the, the management algorithm, with any of these management strategies here, if that intra-abdominal pressure does end up greater than 20 and there is new organ dysfunction or failure that's present, then we want to strongly consider surgical decompression. 
And those are the different overarching strategies that we have for the medical management of intra-abdominal pressure, hopefully decreasing that pressure, providing better perfusion to the end organs, and then hopefully preventing getting to the point of abdominal compartment syndrome and needing that surgical decompression. So again, a lot of really good information here in terms of our algorithms, both for management and then some of the medical management that we can do within there. So there's certainly a lot at our disposal for these patients that have elevated intra-abdominal pressure. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.